So the goal of the today's presentation is to discuss electrodiffusion with a set of equation which is called PNP Poisson and Splunk, and with to look at application for cellular um, microdomain and to understand the electricity and those uh, structure. So let me remind you the context of um, this work and the background. So what defined the voltage um, in a neuron? And in particular, the charge distribution in a neuronal cell is at equilibrium defined by the difference of concentration between the ions outside, which is the potassium, sodium, calcium and chloride, and the same amount of ion inside. The exact regulation is due to pump and transporters. But uh, what is striking from these numbers is that if you look at the charge balance between positive and negative charges, it is clear by doing the, the summation that there are more positive charge than negative charge both inside and outside. Now we are going to concentrate our attention to what happened inside. What is the consequence of having more positive charge in an electrolyte for the voltage distribution and the distribution of charges? Now I would like to add um, some more information about the background. After usually an excellent potential, um, charges such as um, potassium are not coming uh, back directly after they escape to um, the neurons, usually they escape and they are going to be pumped out or pumped in inside uh, glial cells or astrocytes. And so there is a cycle of the potassium before potassium is uh, being able to come back to uh, uh, the neuronal cells. And these cycles take time and it has been described and modeled um, in this um, a publication in Plus Computation Biology. And so the fact that it takes time for these positive charges to come back, and especially potassium, um, shall influence the um, recovery of the cells. And so this is something that we, will, we are interested in also. So the main conclusion here that uh, I would like to draw is that we are going to consider that the neuronal cells has no electrical neutrality at steady state and um, even if they are negatively charged protein this protein because they might uh, be uh, not moving or they might uh, diffuse very slowly they cannot counterbalance the very um, quick motion of the ions so it is actually unclear what is the length scale of electro uh, neutrality. Can we say that we have local electro neutrality after hundreds of nanometers? So this is a question that is unclear. But what is uh, what we would like to um, look at today is that this distance is much larger, much longer than the classical Dubai lengths that we are going to define next. So let me continue on uh, the background. So we are interested in how to model ions in a cellular microdomains. So the first step is to have a model and the model we'll start with is the classical Langevin description. Then we will go from this description to the classical electrodiffusion model and the associated Poisson and Splunk equation and explore the non-electron neutrality condition. So let me remind you that by definition, the Dubai length, which assumes by definition, the way it is derived, electron neutrality in an infinite domain, so that um, in the Poisson and Splunk equation, the exponential term that we're going to see in a second can be linearized. Then the exponential term that is obtained this way, that screens the charge, the, 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 the classical uh, voltage, which is 1 over r, here becomes suddenly 1 over r multiplied by this um, exponential term that um, drastically uh, decay, depending on lambda. 
So in principle, this says that a charge uh, in a medium where there are other charges, and if the uh, we assume electron neutrality, then the, this charge, the effect of this charge, is going to decay exponentially. So I would like to start with um, reminding you the uh, general Langevin equation, uh, which is an equation for describing the uh, a trajectory that's uh, shown here in red. So the equation goes like this. It says that um, the acceleration plus the friction force, which is proportional to the friction coefficient um, gamma multiplied by um, the velocity, plus the potential well or drift equals to the uh, random forces. So this is a stochastic description. And actually, in, um, in electrolyte, uh, we should add water molecules and uh, sum the effect of local um, polarizations of um, the water. But it turned out to be very difficult to analyze uh, such a system. And uh, coarse grain model are needed. In other system, the electrolyte approach with a gradient uh, concentration was explored, especially in the context of um, um, activation of the postsynaptic part of the synapse by charge uh, neurotransmitters. And it was shown that the charges might uh, affect the um, um, opening or the flux of the um, neurotransmitter to uh, the, um, the receptors located on the surface of the postsynaptic uh, density of a neuron. And we have also in the past explored the failure of electron neutrality assumption in uh, this um, review with uh, Raphael Eusti last year in Nature Review Neuroscience. So what are the assumptions we are going to make here? We are going to assume non-electron neutrality. However, we are going to neglect the effect of water molecules, dipoles, the um, local ionic interactions, and many membranes that uh, can be present in the neuronal cells or in dendritic spines. We, uh, can, we can have in mind, for example, um, the membrane due to mitochondria, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, and in uh, any other organelles. At steady state, we assume that there will be no flux of charges. Now, what is the general electrodiffusion equation? We'll start with a smaller Hofsky limit of the equation, where the acceleration is dropped, and then we are left with the uh, friction term, which is equal to the um, uh, charges, the, the, the voltage generated by all moving charges, and the, diffu and the diffusion term. Now the voltage satisfies the classical uh, Poisson equation, which is epsilon epsilon zero divergence of the gradient of the field, which has to be equal to uh, the charges carried by each moving ions. Now we need to add some boundary condition for this um, um, partial differential equation here, and we are going to impose some reflect reflecting boundary condition at the boundary, so there is no flux for the particle, and also we will assume that uh, at the dielectric um, surface, dVdn equals zero. Or we will see later on that if we have a fixed number of charge inside, we need to have a compatibility condition to be satisfied. So, in general, it's possible to simulate such a system, but it's very hard because at each moment of time, the field has to be uh, calculated by solving this um, elliptic uh, partial differential equation. Now, if we have two species, let's say a positive and a negative uh, charge, then the Poisson and Splunk equations uh, can be written this way. So the first equation is, as we have seen, the classical uh, Poisson equation with the positive and uh, negative charges. And then we have what is called the Fokker-Planck equation, 
which is the probability distribution function for the positive here and the negative charge here, which say that uh, d concentration dt equals uh, Laplacian, the charge, plus the drift term here, uh, the drift term for the, for the field, uh, multiplied by the density. And we have the same here for the negative charge, except that we have to add here a negative uh, uh, a minus sign. So, what is the research here, uh, how relevant it is? We would like to find a formalism to study ion distribution in a non electron neutrality condition at steady state. And our goal is to estimate the charge distribution in the micro domain. And this problem remains actually poorly uh, studied and understood. So, the framework to study this general electrodiffusion and be able to better understand how ionic current is transformed. Uh, I mean, th the idea is, is the following, how uh, ionic current is going to be uh, transformed into voltage at uh, a synapse of neuronal cells. So let me draw here a picture. Suppose you have a current going through. We are interested in how this current is going to lead to a difference of voltage or a voltage in this structure. And this voltage is important because if you think about a voltage-gated channel, this change of voltage is what the channel is going to uh, see. And thus, this will tell if the channel is going to open or not, allowing a flux of ion inside. So this conversion from current to voltage is really what we are interested in, especially if you think in terms of electrophysiology, when, when, when the, the neuron is not clamped, not under voltage clamp condition, where there, there is a linear relationship between voltage and current imposed by the electronics. So the methods we are going to use here to make the study of the voltage distribution is going to be a coarse graining of the Poisson and Planck. We are going to use some analysis of the equation to determine the asymptotics and just the dependency of the voltage as a function of uh, parameters. We'll use also th the theory of dynamical systems to study the behavior when we cannot solve asymptotically the equations. And finally, some numerical simulations. So the coarse grain Poisson and Splunk equation with one charge only in the ball can be written this way. This is the uh, solution, this is the Fokker-Planck equation. As we said, d rho dn, there is a term here due to the diffusion and the term here due to the drift. And this is due to diffusion. Now, this is the boundary condition which said that there is no flux. No particle can escape the domain. And the total charge in the domain is fixed to a number capital N. Now this is the Poisson equation for any point here inside the domain which is which says that the Laplace of the potential phi is um, connected to the um, density of charge here. And so now we need to impose here what is called the compatibility condition which is which says that d phi dn equals minus sigma and sigma is equal to the total charge divided by 4 epsilon epsilon 0 pi r squared, where r is the radius here of um, the sphere. We have here capital R. And so we're looking for a steady state solution. And for steady state, so steady state means this term here will be equal to 0. We obtain here the classical Boltzmann solution normalized so that uh, the integration of rho is equal to n and by putting this solution into the Poisson equation we obtain this steady state uh, Poisson and Splunk equation connecting phi here with the exponential of phi. So the remaining uh, goal here would be to find the solution of this equation in this non-electroneutrality context. 
So because of the radial symmetry, the Laplacian becomes uh, just uh, the uh, second derivative plus d minus 1 divided by r, phi prime of r, where d is a dimension. So we will be interested here in dimension 1, 2, and for a biological application to the dimension 3. Now we can always renormalize the variable and we scale by the radius here of the sphere. We change the potential, we normalize the potential and uh, wrote and we write lambda, uh, which is going to be a scaled parameter that depends on the temperature and the total number of uh, charge. So the final equation that we are getting in the geometry of the ball is the following, which is the Laplacian equals um, lambda exponential minus u divided by this normalization now we can always impose that u of 0 equals 0 because u is defined in principle up to a constant and by symmetry the first derivative at 0 equals 0 and we can always change the equation by calling this term here that I'm now um, showing a constant uh, mu so that finally the equation becomes the following now, what is the solution of this equation? So, in dimension 1, by simply multiply the equation by u prime and integrating, we'll get the following solution. u equals log of cos squared of lambda divided by 2 i lambda x, where i lambda is solution of this transcendental equation, and uh, some analysis um, shows that I, mu lambda, which is equal to lambda divided by I lambda, has to be less than pi squared divided by 2, so that the square root of lambda divided by 2 lambda is always less than pi over 2. But what is interesting is when lambda goes to infinity, when lambda becomes large, this parameter, which is um, square root of lambda divided by 2 I lambda, is actually converging to divided by 2 i lambda is converging to pi over 2 and this is the reason why we have here a singularity that develop at the boundary and this is a log singularity and of course if we um, use a, a, a value for square root of lambda divided by uh, 2 uh, lambda that is above pi over 2, you can see there's a singularity inside, but this is not a physical uh, solution. This uh, physical solution here is quite interesting because it shows some type of uh, long-range uh, distribution of charges, and this effect is due to the boundary and to the exponential term. So we are very far from the effect uh, of the Dubai length. Now in dimension 2, it turned out that uh, this uh, equation can also be solved and we get the same type of singularity of log and now instead of having what we had before we had lambda divided by 8 i lambda where i lambda is actually defined by this this is a pi plus lambda divided by 8 and again when lambda goes to infinity it turns out that this term lambda divided by 8 i lambda converges to 1 and again this uh, expresses the singularity that is observed here. And now we will see that the situation is the same in dimension 3, although it's not possible to solve this equation uh, directly. So we'll discuss now in the next uh, slide. So uh, to do this, uh, we need to transform the equation, the classical equation that we had before, using the following change of variable. So we're going to change so we are uh, first of all starting with this equation minus Laplacian u equal exponential minus u in polar coordinates with mu so it was minus u prime prime plus 2 over r u prime equals this now if we change variable and write s equals minus log of r u of r is capital U of s 
Now v of s is a derivative du ds. And finally, w of s is mu exponential minus 2s exponential minus u of s. It is possible by injecting this change of variable into this equation to find a two-dimensional system for uh, this uh, new equation. Now, in the phase space, is shown here. Now, what is interesting is that it turned out that for our system, the initial condition v0 and um, w0 has to be positive. So we have to be in this um, in this half space. And it turned out that when s goes to infinity, the limit has to be the point p0. So, so the only possibility is that the initial condition start on this separatrix showing that here there is a, a unique solution. We start somewhere and converge here to this, um, to this point. This is, the situation is completely different to uh, what happened in this other part of the graph. And this was um, a studied by Gelfand for flame, uh, for flame um, solution of the flame equation, where there was here a many countable solution. So let me uh, finish with this. So we can prove that the solution, actually this is 3D. The solution in 3D can be expressed in terms of log. However, the exact uh, function of F lambda here uh, remains unknown. But um, asymptotic calculations show that uh, it uh, diverges. I mean, f lambda uh, converge to 1 as lambda goes to infinity, which leads to a singularity um, on the boundary of a ball, of a log singularity. So now in dimension 3, this is th the graph that can be obtained for different value here of lambda. And as lambda goes to infinity, you can see how the singularity develop. And this is not something that decays exponentially, it decays with a log term, showing that it influences the distribution of charges inside. Um, for the beginning here of the, the curve of the solution near the uh, center of the ball, an asymptotic and a, and a Taylor expansion show exactly how it depends on these uh, different parameters. And this is the asymptotic uh, expansion that we have obtained by using this ansatz and comparing it to the numerics in here. Numerics is in blue and uh, this ansatz is, uh, is shown here in um, red. And using this expression we can now calculate the difference of potential between the center u0 and any point here located on the surface of the ball. So in dimension one, what is quite interesting is the behavior, which is uh, basically the same in dimension two and three. There is a linear regime, and then it is followed by a log behavior. This is in dimension one, dimension two, and dimension three, showing that the difference of potential between these two points, it depends in a very uh, nonlinear manner of the total number of charge here. So the summary of this part say that charges, uh, because of non-electron neutrality, are not going to follow a classical diffusion uh, approximation steady state where the charges are going to be uniform. They are rather going to be um, distributed uh, uniformly along the surface. And so we found here that um, U0 minus uh, uh, U1 which is a difference of potential, is actually uh, proportional to the log for lambda large, for lambda large, which is which says that the number of charges is large, it's proportional to uh, this uh, log term. And this is a deviation from the classical theory of uh, capacitance. And you see here the different curve 
depending on the total number of charges, how the voltage is, uh, um, is, is changed in a ball of radius 1. So now, as we have seen um, before, the geometry affects the distribution of charges. Now we are going to be interested in the following situation. Suppose we have an inf a, a steady state influx of charges, and suppose that uh, the charges redistribute themselves very quickly on this ball. We are interested in the following question. Suppose we have here a small hall where charge can be absorbed, and each time a charge is absorbed, another one is going to be generated at steady state. So we are interested is what is the time it takes for a charge to escape such a domain? And this is called the mean first passage time. And this is solution of the mean first passage time equation, which is d Laplacian tau minus a drift term gradient tau equal minus 1. We have reflecting boundary condition on this uh, part of the boundary and absorbing condition here. This is the absorbing part. And we would like to study the asymptotic solution of this equation in the case where the gradient is large. A gradient is large here at the boundary, near the uh, uh, surface. So in that condition, we can rewrite the equation. The Laplacian will write the Laplacian as a transversal part, which is if you have, if you imagine you have locally here a plan which is x and y, and here this is the z-direction. This can be rewritten this way, where this is the second derivative in z, and this is the first derivative. And we will neglect any here fluctuations in the x and y direction for the field. Now I tell that, that if v here, the, the v tilde, which is the gradient of the potential, is large, the solution of this equation can be approximated by a two-dimensional um, two the, the solution for the time for a two-dimensional problem and there is a residual term which is, re which is a, a capital O of 1 over V tilde. In other words, um, we can neglect to first order any type of fluctuations that will bring an ion inside the domain. Most of the ions are going to uh, leave in this boundary near the surface, on this boundary layer near the surface. And so to calculate the first uh, exit time, we just simply have to uh, solve the Laplacian equation on a ball with an absorbing uh, boundary, where we have now a Brownian particle moving and we are left with the calculating the mean first passage time to this absorbing boundary. And this is well known. The solution can be written this way. This is 2r squared divided by diffusion log of um, the angle where the, the particle is placed divided by delta. Delta is the size here, the radius of the small hole. And so the solution is well known. It has been calculated uh, several times already in the literature. It's proportional to r square and log of 1 over the delta. So now let's summarize. The mean first passage time, if we have n ions, is given by the time divided by n. And there's the flux of particle, which is um, this 1 over time, is the total charge, which is fixed divided by the time for one particle in the limit of uh, a small radius of um, absorbing window compared to the radius of the ball. So the conclusion is that the global geometry defines the voltage drop. However, the current in this geometry, assuming steady state, is defined by the geometry of the small hole here at the, the beginning of the neck when we have a structure like this, and we were here just focused on this uh, exit from uh, the, um, the, the, the ball here, which represents the head of a dendritic spine. So the conclusion is that 
we have derived here a new capacitance law for an electrical uh, electrolyte uh, ball when there is no electron neutrality. Uh, the geometry plays here a critical role in defining the distribution of the voltage. And uh, the we have seen that uh, the actually the IV relation, which is uh, the, the Q, we should really say here this is a QV relation, is uh, has different regime, a linear regime where the total number of charge is small, and um, a log regime in uh, the case where lambda, the total number of charge is large. So in that case, the geometry defines the voltage and the small hole uh, define the current because the current is defined by the escape time. Um, this is um, the consequence of this non-electron neutrality that we have assumed here and that remains to be uh, confirmed um, experimentally especially with this um, new dye to um, be able to uh, look at the, the, the local voltage inside uh, cellular microdomain such as synapses. Of course, adding the effect of two charges is going to be challenging but quite interesting. And also what uh, we have um, uh, recently observed is that the local curvature can influence the distribution of charges. And the transient regime will, will also be interesting, um, especially uh, to look at how the, the, the voltage is locally affected. Thanks. I will stop now uh, this uh, presentation.